Camera Action Online with Professor Joe Lane, Business 211 Supervision. And we're really going to call it Effective Supervision. Okay? Well, we made it through, uh, made it through Chapter 1. Chapter 2 is a relatively short chapter, but it's a very, very important chapter. Chapter one had to do with leadership and motivation. And I erased some of the stuff that we had up here talking about that. Chapter two is the chapter on change. And the fact that a supervisor must be the primary change agent within an organization. All right, so let's talk for a minute as we get started with this chapter. Again, not a long chapter, or none of our chapters are long, but not really even a long presentation, but some really important stuff. Let's talk about change. Has anything changed in our lives in the last two months? Uh, coronavirus. Have you ever heard the word social distancing so much? Have we changed tremendously how our nation even works and how hopefully we get are going to be able to get back to work? So we've had a probably one of the most humongous, well, probably the most humongous change you may have in your lifetime that's happened to you at this point. But let's let's kind of zero it in a little bit narrower than that. And, you know, aside from the coronavirus, anything changed for you in the last year, two years, five years? Sure. Uh, anything changed for me? Sure. <coughs> you probably have never said, but in my life I have said a few times, especially in a work situation, as soon as we get taken, this taken care of, everything's going to go back to normal and we won't have to worry about things anymore. Or in other words, once we get this done, we won't have to worry about change. Well, that may have been sort of, kind of true in 1960, 70, 80, 90, or whatever. But in 2020, <clears throat> are we in a time of change all the time? Are you ever going to get to the situation where once you get this done, everything's going to be the same for a long, long time? No. No. Change is inevitable. Um, just due to the culture, the technology, and a lot of other things, change is an ongoing thing. Change now is the constant. All right. So I'm going to look at the, the first part of this, 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 uh, this handout for Chapter 2. Is change important to businesses? Wow. If you had gone to the mall for the last 15 years, and every time you went, and you went once a week for the last 15 years. And when you went into the mall, that very first time you listed all the businesses in the mall. And every week that you went back, you crossed off the ones that were gone. And you added the new ones. And you've done that for 15, 15 years. How long would your list be? From here to Ruston, maybe? Would there have been a ton of businesses that left the mall? ton of businesses that came into the mall. Do businesses undergo a lot of change? I mean, right now, of course, in the last several months, it's been, it's been unbelievable. But day in, day out, year in, year out, as we're in the, the 21st century, do businesses go and have a lot of change? If businesses can't adopt, what are, they going, what are they going to do? They're going belly up. Can you think of some businesses that were but aren't anymore? Sears is just about gone. Toys R Us is gone. Blockbusters, if you remember those, are gone. <clears throat> Radio Shack, gone. J.C. Penney? So what I'm saying is, you can think of a lot of businesses that are not in business any longer, and a lot of local businesses places that you went to locally and now they're not there anymore. So change is inevitable. Now, is change good or change bad? 
change is inevitable. It's, it's our responsibility to make that change good change as it affects our lives, our family's lives, or in this case, if you're a supervisor, the life of a business. Now let's look at the first part of this. Guaranteed supervisors will face change. Applis, absolutely. <laughs> Excuse me, let's try that again. Absolutely. So how do they facilitate it? What facilitate it? I don't even like change. Well, you might as well get on board. Because if you're going to be an effective supervisor, you're going to be a change agent. What? Not only are you going to have to accept it, you're going to have to preach it and teach it and mentor it and make sure that your employees embrace it. Because change comes normally from management, and you're a part of that, remember? Okay. Businesses that don't change fall behind. Supervisors must be change agents. I'm just reading up here at the very top of your handout. A lot of times you can't order or demand or command change. You will change. It just doesn't work. A lot of times you have to persuade, influence, and communicate with people to get change. Wow. Well, that goes right back to chapter one. <laughs> you have to persuade people. Remember those things we talked about, the characteristics of a good uh, leader or supervisor? You have to influence, motivation and influence, and you have to communicate that change. So change is a huge part of what you do, or successful implementation of change is very important for what you do as a supervisor. You know, because you are a change agent. Okay, kind of beat that to death. Now the next thing in your handout, he talks about some general strategies. Oh, by the way, this first part that you see up here on, the, on this, uh, your, your uh, chapter notes for chapter two about managers, uh, supervisors being change agents, change is gonna be consistent, all that sort of thing, that today change is inevitable. Those are things you need to be familiar with. You already are, but you need to be familiar with. Some general strategies about change. Uh, paint a word picture. You know, tell your employees what change is going to be, uh, you know, what, what the change is going to be, be like. Uh, take responsibility for the change. Remember that? You know, the idea of you accept responsibility. Write the change down. A lot of times when we write things down, we think we can think through it better, he says. Identify any hidden barriers to change. Uh, what could be some things that could be a barrier to change, especially in our department, our area? He said these are just some general strategies. Explain the change to your employees. Explain what benefits those change are gonna to be to them. Uh, every, involve every employee as it involves change, he says. And listen, listen, listen. Pay attention to what your boss is saying and pay attention to what your employees are saying. Because that's gonna have a lot to do with how successful a change agent you're going to be. Just some general strategies. By the way, I didn't ask you to be familiar with or know those general strategies just threw those out kind of as a way of explaining what we're talking about here. So you don't have to be familiar with, you don't have to know those. Next thing, change isn't a one-time event, it's constant. I said that a few minutes ago when I talked about, hey, if we can just get through this change, everything will be back to normal. Well, what you know, we talk about now is in this, with, the, with what we're dealing with now, the new normal. Normal is not going to be like normal was in the past. It's going to be a new normal out there. And the same thing can, be, can relate to, to, uh, to businesses as it relates to change in general. Change is an ever-going constant thing. It's the new normal. It's constant. It's constantly going to happen. And those that embrace it, those that get ahead of the curve, those that, that can react to it in a positive way are the ones that's going to be successful. Those that can't are going to be the Toys R Us and the Blockbusters. Okay. Uh, now, so he talks about something here. He talks about a company's need to adopt a change management system. Okay. If, if you walk into a company, you're not going to see over a door change management system department. Or even in an organizational chart, you're not going to see a line that goes to change management system. What our author is saying here is, 
is a company should adopt a change management system in its entirety. Uh, the company should have within it the mechanisms for a change management system. Okay, what does that mean? Let's look. Here's what makes up a change management system. Scanners. Who should be looking out for change in a company? Who should be able to recognize something that needs to be changed or something like that? Who should be scanners? Everybody. Does that include your employees? Yeah. Because remember, employees do the work. They do that day-to-day -day work eight hours a day. Sometimes they can see something before anybody else. So in a change management system, if you've got a change management system in your company, everybody should be scanners. Everybody should be looking out for change and things that are going to change or should change. Number two, receiving points. If people recognize change or recognize the need for change, who should they tell about it? You got it. If it's an employee, you should talk to your employee about that. I'm sorry, your, your, your supervisor about that, the supervisor. They're the receiving points. If you as employees come up with something that you think should be changed, needs to be changed, is going to be changed, or whatever, who should you take that information to? Your supervisor. Supervisors are some of the key receiving points. They should receive that information. Number three, deliberation groups. Okay. If employee A brings something here to the supervisor, and it has to do strictly with their department, it's not a big deal, but it's something that could be helpful. The supervisor should say, yep, that's a great idea. And he or she gives credit to that employee, and they implement it within their department. But what if this is something that's bigger than their department? It's something that could affect the entire company or a larger portion of the company than just the department. Okay, a, de a deliberative group. You should have a deliberative group or groups that's, that are set up where if change that comes to the receiving, to the, uh, the receiving points, if these are changes that affect a lot of folks or a lot of departments, these receiving points can then send that to the, the deliberative group so they can deliberate it and see uh, the value of it, how, when, and should it be implemented. And then, if it's something that should be done, and it should be done on a company-wide or multi-department-wide basis, it's probably going to take resources to do. It's going to take upper management support to do. So that's the fourth one, the executive committee. Significant change needs to get approval there. So I just want you to be familiar with what makes up the change management system. Scanners, which are everybody. And since so many of your, of your people that work in a company are non-managerial employees, they're going to make up a huge majority of your scanners, more than likely. Who receives that information about possible things dealing with change? Supervisors are one of the key receiving points. If it involves a lot of folks, that should go to a deliberative group. And if that group feels like it's something that should be done, goes to executive committee for approval. All right. <clears throat> if you have a system, how do you implement the change once approved? All right, now here's the deal. Let me back up again. What companies should have a change management system? Did I hear everybody say all of them? What would be the advantage of not having a change management system? Now, it doesn't have to be incredibly informal. Uh, incredibly uh, formal, it could be informal. But within your company, should you have scanners? Should you have receiving points? Should you have deliberative groups? And should you have some type of executive committee? The answer is sure. So all companies should have change management systems. Okay. Let's say, and I, I want you to be familiar with what change management systems are in the different parts. Here's what our author says. Let's say that it's something and it, it affects multiple departments. And it's gone to the deliberative group. <coughs> they feel like it's a good idea. 
It's gone to the executive committee and it has been approved. Resources have been allocated, <coughs> it's been approved. Is it going to automatically happen? More often than not, no. Look, if you're doing something and you've been doing it the same way for a while and you're comfortable with it, if something comes up that may improve what you're doing, are you just going to race over there and do it? Well, no. Probably what's got to happen is, even if it's a good idea, even if it's a good change, we found that instead of being open as a retail establishment uh, 12 hours a day, it would be a great thing for us to be open 18 hours a day, be open later at night. Or is that just going to automatically happen once that change has been approved? No. It's got to be implemented. So that's what he's seeing right here. So if you have a system, a change management system, how do you implement change once approved? It won't happen automatically. You have to have a change implementation model. So what he's saying there is, once a change has been improved, approved, you have to have a way to implement that change. Okay. Now, if you're looking at your handout, you'll see some words there that have been cut off. Now that may drive some of you crazy. So, right below change implementation model, don't write anything, but just listen to me. <clears throat> what are some things you can do to implement the change? Develop a picture of what the change is going to, be look, it's going to look like after the change. Communicate that change to all involved. Provide training. Then go ahead and implement the change. Make any adjustments or monitor it. Now, I really don't want, I, I don't want us to, I want us to be familiar with the change management system. The only thing I want you to be familiar with with a change implementation model is this. You need to have a way to implement the change once it's been approved. That's all. That's all you need to be familiar with. Back side of the page for me, maybe the next page for you. Now this text was written in the early 2000s. It's probably one of the older texts we use here at Delta, but it's a great text. That's why we keep using it. He talks about something called restructuring. He talks about restructuring and change. This is not quite as true in 2020 as it was when he wrote this text. But let me talk about restructuring from the point of view that he talked about it in the early 2000s. <clears throat> a lot of times, and by the way, we had a very major recession in about 2008. And we came out of that recession and we've been doing great with our economy, but we are back into a recessionary period because of this coronavirus. But let's talk about the term restructuring. A lot of times, especially in the early 2000s, in 2008, 2009, 2010, when we were in a pretty good recession, and very likely in 2020, 2021, 2022, I don't know how long all this is going to last. When a company talks about restructuring, what may they be talking about? Getting more bigger or getting more littler? You love that, love that English, huh? All right. A lot of times when companies restructure, it's talking about getting smaller. Now, that's why I said this is the way he took it in two th and when he wrote this text. You can also restructure larger, but restructuring larger is never really too much of a problem. But I want to take, I want to talk about, and as we finish this chapter, restructuring as it relates to downsizing or getting smaller. Sometimes companies have to restructure smaller because of the economy, perhaps because their product is no longer a product that is used as much as in the past. Whatever reason, companies have to restructure and downsize. And I think, excuse me for just walking out on you here, but, I, but again, looking at the, the text, and it, he makes a statement, 
few words can strike fear in the hearts of employees as quickly as the term restructuring. This word has become synonymous with layoffs, terminations, plant closing, and workforce cuts. Okay, one last time. That's not always true. And I'd say in the last 2014 to our 15, 16, 17, 18, 2019, up until this coronavirus, there were not that much restructuring downward. There was a lot more restructuring getting larger. But one last time, taking it in the context of when you have to restructure and downsize, which happened in 2008, 9, and 10, and could be happening now in 2020, there is a responsibility of restructuring or downsizing in the right sort of way. Does the supervisor have a responsibility as it relates to restructuring? And the answer to that is they have a very, very strong uh, role to play as you restructure because sometimes when you're downsizing what makes you you do you may be losing some of your employees there may be situations where you have to make the determination of which employees you lose uh, under maybe, maybe if this is a company that's unionized or whatever that might be taken care of in the union contract but if not it may be a decision that you have to make so he says I just want to leave you with some things to consider when you're looking at downsizing your company. And I've got them in your handout. I'm just gonna, I'm just, and I happen to have my text right here next to me. So I thought I would, uh, I thought I would kind of, kind of just use it. As he talks about restructuring and change. Here's what he says that you need to do. You being primarily the supervisor, but also the organization as a whole. The organizations and individuals can control how they respond to changes brought on by restructuring. Okay. Steps for making restructuring effective. Now we're talking about the downsizing type. Number one, be smart and empathetic. Um, be smart how you, about how you downsize. Be smart about how you handle downsizing. And be empathetic to those people that are involved. Okay, who's going to be involved? Everybody's going to be involved. Some people are going to be involved very negatively. They may lose their jobs. The people that stay, their jobs are probably going to change. Should you have empathy for everyone as it relates to that? The answer is yes. Now look, don't fake empathy. If you really don't care, your people are going to know. But if you're an effective supervisor, you do care. He says the first thing, be smart and empathetic. Number two, be smart and empathetic with everyone. Organizations can do things to people that are going to lose their positions or their employment as a result of restructuring. Number two, he says, is paint the picture. For those people that are remaining, are they going to be nervous? Yeah. What's this thing going to look like? How's it going to affect me? Step number two, Communicate the change picture. What's it going to look like after the change? They need to know. Because this is how it's going to look. Let them know so they can embrace it, so they can be ready for it. Number three, establish incentives that promote the change. Do things that will help them buy into the change. Do you mean like monetary things perhaps? Yeah. It could be a number of different things, but provide incentives for your employees that you've got to move to that new picture you just showed them. Number four, continue to train. I can't tell you how important it is when a company's going through, and we're talking about a specific, it could be any kind of change, but right now we're talking about downsizing, restructuring. Those folks that are going to be remaining their jobs are probably going to change. What they do is probably going to change. How they do it is going to change. It scares them to death. I hadn't, been in, I hadn't been in school in 20 years. I hadn't been in school in 30 years. I don't know if I can do this new thing. I don't know how to train. Train and train and train. Yeah, you can. You can do it. You can do it. We're going to see that you can do it. We're going to give you the training that you need to be able to handle the new job.
So the last thing he mentions in chapter two is he talks about restructuring from the point of view of downsizing a company. He says that can, that can put fear in the hearts of everybody. Certainly those people that are gonna be laid off. Certainly those people that, uh, that are gonna remain. You know, right now, isn't that true all over our nation? People that, you know, have been out of a job because business has been closed, are they going to need them when they open back up? Are they going to need as many people when they open back up? Uh, might I not have a job? What if nobody comes to Delta Community College? That could be a problem. You see what I'm saying? You know, so, so we can put fear in people's hearts. As a supervisor and as a company, one more time, what do you need to do? Be smart of how, how you do it and, and, and have empathy for everybody that's involved. Communicate the picture. Here's what it's gonna look like on the other side. Establish incentives and things to help people work towards the other side and continue to train, train, and train. That's chapter two. That's the two on change. Uh, uh, Supervisors have to be change agents. They're the ones that's going to implement most of the change. Now, let me, let me finish up with something that's important to you from a supervisor's point of view. What if you don't like the change? Hey, we're getting ready to make this change in our company. You know, this change, the change management system, we found some change and then, you know, and it went up to the deliberative group and it went up to the executive committee and now they're going to implement this change. I don't like it. I don't like this change. I'm, super, I'm, I'm this person right here. I'm this, I don't like this change. Is that what you need to tell your employees? Hey, look, I don't like it. I don't like it. We're going to have to do it, but I don't like it. Huh. No, no, no. No, no. You're one of them. You're one of those that made the change. Hey, I didn't have that. You're management. You're one of those that's a part of management that made the change. Your job is to implement that change. Implement that change, you're a change agent. You embrace it, you show the picture on what it's gonna be like on the other side, how it's gonna be better for those employees, how it's gonna be better for the company. And even if inside you're not fully convinced, you're part of this, you're a part of this management team. So it's your responsibility to see that your employees embrace it, get on the other side of it, and you're better off for it. So don't, don't forget that. Okay, I think that's chapter two. I think it tells us about how important change is. It's gonna be with us always. Change is a constant, it's the new norm. Uh, employees, uh, supervisors have to embrace change. They have to be ready for change. They have to try to get ahead of it. It's a lot better to be proactive than reactive if you possibly can. Uh, as you know, the way we do a chapter is when we get through with it, I have to make a loud noise so my executive producer, Professor Ryan Pierce, can uh, uh, know that we are finished with a, uh, uh, with a chapter. I'll, I'll do this postscript on this chapter. Professor Pierce is change, he is continually looking at ways to change things to make things better. Uh, here at Delta Community College, uh, we have our Business and Technology degree program, which is by far one of the largest degree programs here at Delta. We've also implemented an Information Technology degree program. We've implemented a Computer Science uh, program. He was a, a real leader in bringing about the change that made those things possible for students. So he embraces change, uh, <clears throat> and he's a change agent for our school of business. Okay. That was just a commercial, say something nice about him. He may listen to this and give me a pay raise, who knows. All right, let me get this thing uh, finished. We are now through with the chapter on change. See you in chapter three.